world uh, as always we try to bring you the coolest people uh, sometimes we don't quite hit the mark and we didn't today <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen welcome my friend terry mcbride oh it's humbling business <laughs> How are you doing, oh man? man great to see you good again. to see you yeah you too thanks uh mcbride the ride uh you've written songs for brooks and dunn reba uh, yeah, a few, uh, Garth and uh, Alan and uh, yeah. Hank Jr. to, uh, you know, Cole Swindell or whatever. It seems it, like it's a long list. Thank goodness yeah. it's it's gotten longer over the years, but I've been doing it yeah. for quite a few years, yeah, to say the least. At least from the, the, the past stuff, it was really good mailbox money. Yeah, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. It allowed me to keep my house, yeah. for sure, which is really important. Uh, when you're a musician, that's, yeah. that's really what it, it comes down food. to that. Food and the place, a place to live and call your own is really about all I've hoped for early on. So I far exceeded all my expectations early on. But uh, yeah, it's been good. I'm, I'm still getting, you know, I'm still getting a few things that are happening. I'm not writing as much as I was because I've been on the road yeah. so much this this past year, especially. But uh, you released an album. Was it two years ago now? Yeah, probably uh, almost two years yeah. ago. Yeah, uh, when we first sure. kind of reconnected yeah. after all the, those years, but. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Hotels and Highways. Great. Album. was called. Yeah, thanks, man. I was really proud of that. Still do a couple of those songs from that little EP, but uh, Boots Off is still get a great response from that. And it was a good song, and the title cut really still hits home with me, and one of the songs I like because of that. You and know? you did a video for that, too. Yeah. Which was kind of a retrospective right. <laughs> video. Of all and the old days. And my whole movies yeah. from back in the day, hey, those came in handy. We young friend of mine, Jason Lee Denton, put that video together and uh, gave him a bunch of, uh, we had since, you know, put those old handy cams onto a little DVD, digital, sort yeah. of digital, exactly, as, so he could use it. He just picked from that some of those crowds from back in the days, and the mullet was on full display, too. So. I still love the mullet. <laughs> I had one. Of them. Yeah, who would have thought? Here yeah. it is coming back. It's fashionable again. Who yeah, thought I, don't, that? I don't think any woman in my life would like to get away with that. I still think it's practical, though. You can do well, a we've, ponytail. We've still got a little hair, so yeah, it's not. It's right. never too late. Yeah, we're fortunate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know people. I remember meeting a fan early on. This woman, and she was like, "Man, Terry, you sounded good. You know, you, you look good, but I'm so disappointed." I went, "Oh no, here it comes." Yeah, here it comes. I no longer had the mullet. Yeah. She's like, "Let her down." I went, well, sorry, but you know, all good things must come to an end. Well, with the 90s uh, revival in, in music styles with country music, the mullet's got to be back. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Morgan Wallen, the yeah. young artist, he's embraced it and it's sort of got <laughs> back on track a little bit. Where it goes from there, I don't know. I'm, I had a hairdresser tell me one time, you know, the mullet is uh, the rage in Paris. I went, really? well, I wouldn't, wasn't Jerry Lewis huge there too? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody understands that. Yeah, we're not sure well, why that happened <laughs> either. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's crazy. But, yeah, I'm reminded all the time people send me something. Or those videos, of course, YouTube has kept a mullet, uh, you know, will forever be around. I think the only guy that didn't have a mullet in the 90s was George Strait. Yeah, and, he, <laughs> and Garfield never really had no, he early on. Yeah. He was more cowboy clean cut. Yeah. Uh, the hat, hat acts, you know, I mean, there were plenty. Alan had his yeah. mullet. Tracy Lawrence, those yeah. guys all had the hair in the back. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Business Crazy. in front, party in back, <laughs> just like an El Camino. <laughs> Absolutely, which I like those too. Yeah, so El Camino is the mullet of vehicles. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> Not everybody likes it, but yeah. it, it was popular. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you've been out on the road. Yeah, tons. Uh, yeah, it's taken you, man. California. You yeah, spent a lot of time in Texas. Two trips on the West Coast, a lot of time in California. Had a good East Coast run yes. of this year and uh, playing a lot of this. You know, the uh, touring uh, business is still out there, but it has changed a little bit. So I'm able to 
uh, sort of take advantage of one this interest in songwriters, yeah. which really didn't exist no. a few years ago. I mean, the the Bluebird in Nashville sort of embraced that early on, yeah. but around the country, the songwriter was always the unknown, you know, in the business. You, you, you love the song, had no idea who wrote it. Most people in their minds think the artist wrote the song. George Strait was always that way. It's like he yeah. sang it in such a believable manner. You figured he wrote that song, yeah. but it wasn't the case, especially early on. But because of that, there are just a, a lot of fantastic venues that are smaller, not maybe even fit an entire band, yeah. but for a solo guy, a storyteller, sort of song, singer, songwriter, there are lots of opportunities and places to play, which I, I didn't really even know that because I'd always, we were doing festivals and fairs and it was full blown band things, you know. But uh, we found them thanks to my agent who's done a good job of just digging out those venues that are, you know, that are a good fit. Uh, we've hit almost all of them <laughs> this and, past year. And you know, it's not just big now in the U.S., it's big in Canada and yeah. the U.K. and Australia. I mean, that, that whole songwriter thing right. has just gone worldwide. Yeah, it's great. I mean, if you've had a little success, then you can add that, you know, to yeah. your uh, bag of tricks to get out there and and uh, help spread the word a little bit. And then with some new music, I mean, that's kind of the really the catalyst that kind yeah. of keeps everybody moving and going and interest and something to talk about. Uh, and it's something we just finished up a record this year, a full 10 sides uh, yes. that we're gonna hopefully release uh, the first quarter of uh, the new year, yeah, 2020. And uh, it, the first album out of the box for 2020, somebody has to name an album Hindsight. Yeah, really. <laughs> that would be a good title, man. Let's see, I don't even have a title yet. No, I do. Because uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah, that's it, man. That's a perfect tie-in, <laughs> to say the least. Yep, the, the album, the title cut from my record is, is uh, called Rebels and Angels. It's a song I wrote with Chris Stapleton. Uh, it's a very, it, it's it's such a throwback. It's First of all, it's a waltz, you know, so very different, very traditional, and it's a duet with Patti Loveless. Uh, which is doesn't hurt uh, or suck at all for yeah. sure because such a fan and I sent her the track and she was gracious enough to go you know what I like the song and I'm gonna uh, what I'm gonna do this year is I'm gonna sing on your record I'm like wow that's right. pretty fantastic she's one of those voices that can take and I'm not implying yours is an average song, <laughs> but she can take an average song and by adding her voice to it, it can elevate it, it to a whole different level. Yeah, her her skills really come out and shine on this track because basically just sent her the rough of my vocal and let her do what she wanted to on her portion of the song, and she added some fantastic bluegrass little haunting ooze and yeah. melodic things that were on the record, you know until she uh, put her vocal on there, and that's what got a big part of it. And then we get to harmonize together, and she's sort of the, I'm the rebel, she's the angel nice. in the song, but it's a, it's a beautiful song. I'm really proud of that tune, and that's kind of the centerpiece of the record. I also have my old um, pal and former boss, Delbert McClinton's on the record, which I love Delbert. He's, uh, you know, he's a badass, and always was, still is. Still is. Uh, like 76 years old, I think, nominated yeah. for a Grammy. Yeah. Uh, he's just, he, he's just continues to rock on and, and do what he's always done, and hasn't really lost a step. I mean, uh, I, I think across so many genres, the older guys now are reinvigorated, and it, it's like they're doing best work of their life. Well, guys like that especially, he sort of carved out yeah. a thing that he does yeah. that nobody else really does, you know? And when you can do that and do it well, then people recognize that. That's that's the whole key to anything that anyone's out there trying to do. If you can do it, and it's interesting because I recently had this discussion with uh, someone that owns a venue, and they were telling me, you know, a lot of older guys doing it, not all of them do it well. Yeah. But if you can, then you really, you've got a chance. You know, fortunately, I'm still healthy. Uh, I can still sing and, and uh, I've really worked on it. I've worked so hard this past year, practicing, rehearsing, learning, <laughs> relearning songs I didn't know that I wrote, you know? Yeah. So it's been an interesting year for me and a challenge, but I've enjoyed it. You know, I've embraced it and the, and the 
people that come out to see me, that's what kind of keeps me going and feeling that I'm doing something right uh, in a small way, no matter how big or uh, small the crowd is. It's just, it's been pretty rewarding when it comes down to the actual 90 minutes I do each night, you know. I mean, I, I've been a fan of your stuff since day one, and it, it still thrills me that you get to sit here and talk. <laughs> you want to do a song? Yeah, yeah. sure, I'll do something. Right. Uh, let's see. I don't know what exactly. I don't have a set list, a two song set list, but I can do something older, maybe something newer. Whatever it is, it's your time to show. Okay, sitting down is a little weird, but I'll get used to it here. Because you know songs are special. Yeah, and they're like children. Yeah, you've heard that it's forever. Who's yeah. your favorite? You can't pick a favorite. That's song. right. But you yeah, know, there, there's a song that's that's probably one of my favorites because of for several reasons, and one is um, one is that it was a hit, <laughs> and two is uh, Reba McIntyre was involved in it. But really, the other thing that kind of makes it special is my daughter. At the time, she was about five. My little redhead, she played Reba in a video oh, okay. as a little girl. Yeah. And then the cool thing was Ronnie's little redhead, Haley played the teenage Reba, and then Reba played the real Reba, which is fantastic, you know. And, but I just like the song. It's one of those sort of story songs that kind of makes country different than what it is, you know. And uh, it's uh, it's touching and sweet and 
but we had Reba in mind for that tune all along, sort of as our inspiration and the strong woman in the song. Yeah. And then, um, and then it, it all kind of came together, which in Nashville and in the music business in general, in life, things don't always come together. We, yeah. Even if it's a plan, you know, this is one of those situations where it did, it, 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 it came song. together, it, it really did. Yeah. It, it, it came together, and I've had that happen a couple times, and Reba's been involved. I have a song called If You See Him, If You See Her, yeah. with, and, with, with, with Brooks and Dunn, with Brooks and, Dunn yeah. and Reba. And at first, it fell apart because they were on different labels. Yeah. Even though the song they felt was perfect, uh, it, it wasn't going to happen. And Reba, bless her heart, she just kind of came to Ronnie one day and went, listen, we love this song. And this was several months later after disappointments. You know, I was going there. Here I wrote, we wrote this song we thought was perfect because we wrote it for them. And then she finally stepped up and said, you know, we love this song. Let's find a way to make it work. And I'll be darned if they didn't, you know. It's but, like a lawyer. So. Yeah, it really was. It was sitting down with the labels and making it work. But the song I was talking about at the beginning is a song called Cowgirls and Cry. Right. And I just like the song, I do it every night. Yeah. You can tell a little story about it. And it's always going to be a special tune. That was a great song. And that was on the... Uh... Well, that was the last full album that Brooks and Dunn put out, wasn't it? I guess it was that. Cowboy Town. Yeah, was it Cowboy Town? Yeah, you're Cowboy right, I think it was. Hillbilly Deluxe was the one before yeah. that, you're right. And yeah. uh, they just did it themselves. Yeah. Up on there, and then you're right, the label one was released as a single. That was the cut. It was Brooks and Dunn yeah. on the album just by themselves. Yeah. And we had a couple little meetings and a couple little get togethers. And Reba was saying, you know, if you don't release that song, I'm going to record it on my next album. Yeah. She was telling Ronnie, so Ronnie, went, dang it, you know, we got to maybe release this song now. And it was actually the fourth single, which is a long, deep, yeah. it's a long time to wait for that song to come. Yeah. And as it took time to get there, Reba went in, and she and her husband at the time, they sat down, and they actually had Reba come in, and she just sang a harmony part all through the record. And it was cool, but it wasn't, you know... Yeah. Uh, dynamically, you know, life changing for the song enough to where they could do, say it's a duo. So she went in and they sat at the piano with a couple glasses of wine or whatever one night, and they had the whole idea of let's modulate, let's break down that last verse. I'll come in, sing the last verse and about about killing off dad at the end, you know, which we did. And uh, it was fantastic. So we quickly put together a band. Went down to Starstruck, which was Reba's studio. I played bass. I brought, we had 80 bears that day, I think. A couple guys from the band, Gary Morris, our steel player. A couple of the guys, we threw the band together. We took the original version, spliced it, cut it, edited in the whole new band because we modulated yeah. up to a whole different key. Reba all of a sudden, you know, magically appears. And then we took it out from there. And so that's how the record, the final single came to so, be. So that... That modulation, that's a whole other band than the rest that's of the That's a whole different band. <laughs> None of them. So they had me going, the engineers wow. drove them crazy. Yeah. One, I'm, the original song, I can tell it's a five string bass. Yeah. I've only played a four yeah. string. First of all, the tone is completely different. But they had to try to match those tones, yeah. starting with the bass, which is what a pain. Engineers going, damn it, this guy. You know? But uh, we had fiddle, uh, Jimmy. Yeah. Stewart, who played the Brooks Dunn, he came in and played the fiddle. Totally different fiddle player. Totally different steel player. Drummer and wow. bass, everything's different. I yeah. got you all didn't know that. <laughs> no, that's all a different band just on that line. Well, that's something I need to talk about. Yeah. Uh, because it's an interesting uh, happening that just doesn't happen normally in the business. You know, yeah. engineers and producers are so structured where they want their guys, and it has to be a certain way. Yeah. And there we went in and completely. You know, change the whole formula into something yeah, that would be a little bit happen. different today with all the computers and everything. Right. right. Oh, that's not. But back in the day, yeah. here we had to have live guys, yeah. and, all, and not only live guys, the entire band. Yeah. Six, seven pieces in there, and then making it all happen. That's such a strange song. I remember Reba came out on the road and did it a couple times. One out in Los Angeles, uh, played the cool amphitheater with Brooks and Dunn. And the cool thing is, the song's an A. <laughs> Her daddy gave her her first pony. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it, it changes and modulates and goes up into an E. And it's sort of hidden. And Reba has to not only find that note, uh, it's hanging out there somewhere, <laughs> but it's not the original key. So it really takes sort of a skilled person to pull that off live, which we found that in rehearsals a couple times because it's like there's a note that's hanging there. 
but she has to find it and we have to go into the new key. But uh, really different, but really cool when it all comes together. You want to do another song? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Anything in particular? Or? You want to do that one? Uh, well, yeah, I'll do a little yeah. cowgirls. Yeah. yeah, I will since we spent all that time yeah, talking. About that. <laughs> but yeah. Hey, we don't have to get another guitar. Part <laughs> of We're going to have to bring the ring with you know, just, I'll do the ring part, but in my own voice. So. Yeah. Powerful too, you know. I mean, like we said, we had to kill Dad off in the third verse, but it was like, according to Ralph Murphy, that was the best thing to do. Is that <laughs> Because if they just leave, yeah. they're a loser. That's right, that's right. If you kill them, you feel sorry for them. Well, and Dad is such a big part of the story from yeah. the beginning to the end. We figured we would just wrap it up that way, you yeah. know. But uh, and make it a powerful and sad moment, but still, it's uh, it's kind of the uh, liberties you get to take with songwriting. I mean, we could make it go whichever direction we wanted to. And we started that song. Remember, we were at a fair uh, that day where Brooks and Dunn were playing the big grandstand that night. You know, and when we played these fairs, Ronnie would always like, uh, "Let's go see if there's a good corn dog out there." You know? <laughs> Which of course you only had to go about six feet yeah. to find one. And as we were walking along that day, we saw something, and it sort of sparked. A conversation which led to the title yeah. and so we went back to the bus we started it immediately it's like cowgirls don't cry I love that and we started talking about Reba because she's a strong woman in many ways she grew up yeah. on a ranch in Oklahoma 
the brothers always got the good horses, left her with the rank stock, yeah. you know, that's how she became a fantastic so girl racer, and, uh, you know, fearless, those girls are fearless, you know. She still is. She still is, and when, when you know her, meet her personally, yeah, there's a lot, many layers to Reba, and she's smart, and so we wanted that kind of woman in the song, and so we really used her. And so when we finished the song like four o'clock that morning, going down the road from one uh, date to the next overnight, uh, Ronnie emailed her the lyric. Uh, and the first thing in the morning, she hit us right back. And she went, I love this and I want to record it. And Ronnie went, no way, I'm going to record it. So in my mind, I'm sitting there going, it's a good problem to have. Yeah. You know, I've got Brooks and Jones, <laughs> yeah. uh, I got a good shot at this thing maybe getting recorded, which isn't always the case, you know. But hanging out in those circles, that really became my focus and my job for about 13 years. If I had a good title, a good idea, of course, I'd always take it to Ronnie first, you know. And... Uh, he was a big supporter of mine, Kicks as well. Those guys were so good to me and it allowed me to just come and go and be part of their whole world there for 13 years and uh, really didn't get off the bus once I first got on it and uh, there was really no need. Yeah. We were having fun, we were having success and did the last three years, I actually played bass with them on the road and it was in the band. It was like, it was a lot, but it was still fun. And, and then the farewell tour, I kind of hit a wall where I wanted to get my act together, clean myself up. Yeah. I was struggling with a lot of issues, and uh, I stepped away from it, only because I saw the beginning of the end for them. They were wrapping it up, you know, and I wanted to try to go on and do some other things, and uh, that led me to this solo project, which otherwise I normally would not have done. Yeah, and, and I mean, your stuff, your solo work is, it's got the McBride the Ride, <laughs> roots to it yeah the feel to it but it's very much solo stuff it's yeah, very cool. much terry mcbride yeah I, I think that ep reflected yeah. that a little bit still sort of contemporary like you said a little bit of that mcbride the right influence yeah. which i love harmony stuff I, I love that kind of thing you know as a young guy growing up in the 70s uh i was attracted to all sorts of bands like pure prairie league yeah. remember i saw vince gill with them early on and yeah. knock me out and the, of course the Eagles were our, uh, you're a harmonies guy I you, love that sort of thing you love the bands with the harmonies yeah I do I, whether it was I mean there's a whole list of people I could go yeah. all the way back to Desert Rose to the Birds to whatever yeah. harmony things I just loved it you know and then when I got to sort of be a part of a band like Ride and Ride the cool thing about that band was we were sort of put together by producer Tony Brown amazing guy and producer amazing career but he really wanted a band for MCA yeah. he signed me as a solo artist and he said you know Terry we need a band uh, we have Desert Rose they're, they're done they're going they're, yeah. they're breaking up no longer and he goes the hardest thing about an act is having the band if we put a band together you'd have it and he goes I got a couple guys in mind and Billy Thomas and Ray Herndon were a couple of guys so they brought us in with Steve Fischel as well as amazing steel player and they thought this is going to be a super group. They all come from various backgrounds. Well, I love it. Vince Hill, and Harris. You know, it's going to be great. Devil with Clinton. But that wasn't the important factor at all. It wasn't the thing that the fans cared about. What they cared about was that little three-part harmony that magically happened. Billy's an amazing tenor singer. Ray is that warm baritone guy. And I'm right in the middle. I'm a tenor singer, too. But it just sort of happened, you know. And then that was our calling card. You know, once the first single came out, kind of count on you simple country song yeah. that opened the door and that sort of gave us a direction which prior to that we didn't know what our direction was we just knew that i was writing these songs we had a good band then we had something to focus on after that so we really took advantage of it uh you hear all sorts of talk today about people that complain oh that's a fake band they've been <laughs> it's like Brooks and Dunn then are a fake band yeah. because they were put together well somebody has to put the band together yeah. we were fortunate to have a brilliant mind and ears of a producer yeah. that was producing, you know, Steve Earl, I love it, George Strait, whoever you like, you sung along to some of those songs. And we were fortunate to have this guy that, that was cared enough about what we were doing to help us introduce. Now, it was up to me. If we had gotten together and we didn't hit it off, it wouldn't have happened either. Right. But we just, we hit it off. We liked each other. Musically, we were on the same page, so it wasn't a struggle. And, you know, what's happened now, all these years later, Camo, because we had a 
cool thing going in the 90s. We've remained friends all these years. And now we're going to get back, possibly, to do some dates. I was going to say, you talked about bringing back Big Fry and the Rye. Yeah, which is interesting because not just, I could have gone out there and done McBride and the Rye with some guys in the band. Yeah. Towards the end of my career, I had to do that. It yeah. was never the same, even for me. The feeling wasn't exactly the same, even though I had great musicians in the band. So it would be coming back, not only McBride and Rye, but the original cast. That's uh, going to be cool, because there's always that discussion, too, when you come back with different players, it's just a cover band. Yeah. You know, you're, and a lot of guys do it because yeah. there's something that happened in the band that broke yeah. it up, obviously, and that can't be healed in yeah. many cases. We can go all the way back to Seals and Croft, whatever yeah. you want to, however far you want to go back, and, you know, uh, Crosby, Steels, Nash, yeah. you know, whatever. I mean, it just happens. It's a lot of creative people. There are a lot of things that come it's along. It's going to be bound to be. There, it just doesn't always a perfect union. And really, the time that we spent on the road, it was fantastic. We mm -hmm. had so many laughs and so many good memories that now, uh, you know, Billy is with Vince Gill. I really haven't talked about this. It'll be kind of the first time we sort of yeah. revealed this a little bit. But you're, you're in on the secret. <laughs> we've been talking about it, and Ray came out to see me in Phoenix. He kind of got the ball rolling. And then uh, tossed the idea to Billy Thomas, and then we recently got together, discussed it. I have a young agent that's fantastic, doing a great job for me, and He's sort of thrown it out there. We have some interest. So uh, maybe this first quarter of 2020, we'll do a few dates. And then maybe every year, it'll be something we can all look forward to as far as us and the band. Yeah. If we're having fun with it, then I think the fans will definitely then enjoy it. You do some dates, and then you go back and do your own solo stuff. Yeah. And then they're it, back with their guys. Yeah. And that's I mean, excellent. even with like, uh, you know, Ray plays with a lot of love it on the road. And that's kind of what Lyle does a lot of that. He'll do the large band. Yeah. He'll do a smaller version, and then he'll do solo dates as well. And it's something those guys, like I said, Ray is out with Lyle. Billy spends a lot of time with Vince Gill on the road. So when those dates aren't happening, uh, we can kind of build around it, you know. And they know, you know what quarter of the year Vince is going to work. The same with Lyle. And then we can take advantage and do some dates. Because one, there's interest. The yeah. 90s thing is That's very popular. Uh, it's something we want to do, not something we're forced to have to do yeah. or... Uh, it's something we can enjoy. You and know? it's different from the old days where you got into this, well, we have to do this. Oh, my gosh. And, and all the dates, wearing you down. Oh, my gosh. Now it's like, we're doing this because it's fun and we yeah. like it. Yeah, and I think it it'll, 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 will bring that whole vibe on the stage each night. We'll be having fun with it. Because even when Ray got up and sang with me out in Phoenix this year when I played, he, he lives there in Scottsdale. Uh, it was kind of, it was a wonderful moment, you know, and he realized it, I did too. We've always known it, and those guys are still actively playing and singing, so it's not like we have to drag some old out of shape guy yeah. onto the stage to try to make the band complete. It's something that would be fun, and, and another sort of little sidebar to what we already do, you know. Yeah. But like you said, if we don't focus the whole year on having to do it, I think we'll have some success with it because of that, you know. Well, yeah. You want to do... One final song and, and uh, uh, okay, I'll do a little. We'll rock it out a little bit. We'll okay, do, we'll do a little, this is the last number one song for Brooks and Dunn, right, cool. and, and it just so happens I was uh, got in on it with Ronnie. He came off the stage that night and had a fantastic idea. And he was all full of energy, which he always was after a great show. You know, fifteen thousand screaming fans. Then what do you do with that energy yeah. after the show? Well, he brought it on the bus, and we ended up writing this little tune. <laughs> Oh. 
guys together. Come do another show. Yeah, it's, man. It's, it'd we'll, be fun. We'll oh. do an official kind of watch. I appreciate that. Yeah, that'd be great. It'd be a good excuse to come back and see you. You, so. don't, you don't need to excuse <laughs> All you have to do is call me up and tell oh, me. Oh, thanks, show. man. I got something to talk about. Oh, I've yeah. always enjoyed it. I appreciate you, and, and you've, you've been such a, a supporter from the first time we met. Yeah. Back with the uh, a couple years ago, yeah. you were very interested in what I was doing, and I like people like that. I don't like to... To come back and, and, and see him and be a part of what you're doing as well. Thank so you. thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for watching today. <laughs> Terry McBride, watch out for new stuff for him in the new year. And also, McBride the Ride. That's going to be really cool. Thanks again for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Camo. We'll talk to you later. Thank you for watching. Make sure you catch me on Chris Country every Sunday midday, right following the Bobby Bones Show all across the UK and on 88.9 Tamworth FM in Tamworth, New South Wales, Australia, Thursday morning with Jody Crosby and John Wall. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Oh,